O God, whose never-failing providence ordereth all things both in heaven and earth, we humbly beseech thee to put away from us all hurtful things, and to give us those things which be profitable for us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we are with Professor Philip Edgecombe Hughes, Theology of the English Reformers, and we're talking about justification by faith alone. And we're talking about faith and works. And now for Thomas Beacon, another man repressed in the English Inquisition. In his preface to the commonplaces of Holy Scripture that works are the fruits of faith and good testimonies unto our conscience, that our faith is true and unfeigned, but helpers unto our justification or salvation they are not, as the sun cannot be without light nor the fire without heat. No more can the true and Christian faith be without good works whensoever occasion is offered either for the glory of God or for the profit of our neighbor. If such faith ceaseth to work, then it is not an evangelical, but an historical faith. Closed quote from his book, volume two, page 291. Good works that follow and testify to a right faith are no more meritorious, however, than are works performed apart from the true faith. They are indeed acceptable and pleasing to God, and they are required of Him. But they are performed by reason of the inward operation of the Holy Spirit in the regenerate life. And all the glory belongs to God, who thus enables man to perform what he commands. We are sure, says Tyndall, that God hath created and made us new in Christ and put his spirit in us that we should live a new life, which is the life of good works. The life of a Christian man is inward between him and God and for properly is the consent of the spirit to the will of God and to the honor of God. God's honor is the final end of all good works. Again, every Christian man ought to have Christ always before his eyes as an example to counterfeit and follow and to do his neighbor as Christ hath done to him. Moreover, though thou show mercy unto thy neighbor, yet if thou do it not with such burning love as Christ did unto thee, so must thou acknowledge thy sin and desire mercy in Christ. A Christian man has nothing to rejoice in as concerning his deeds. His rejoicing is that Christ died for him and that he is washed in Christ's blood. It is true, that was closed quote, it is true that the New Testament speaks in terms of rewards for those who prove themselves good and faithful servants of their heavenly master. But even so, all the merit is Christ's, and the faithful servant works not for the sake and love of the reward. And so far as he does, he is, a faith, he is unfaithful and governed by self-interest, but for the sake and for the love of Christ. His work is freely rendered, and yet without all self-seeking. When the gospel is preached unto us, says Tyndall again, we believe the mercy of God, and in believing we receive the Spirit of God, who is the earnest of eternal life. And we are in eternal life already, and feel already in our heart sweetness thereof, and are overcome with the kindness of God and Christ, and therefore love the will of God, and of love are ready to work freely, and not to obtain that which is given us freely, whereof we are heirs already. 
So let thine eye be single and look unto thy good only and take no thought for the reward, but be content. For as much as thou knowest, art sure the reward and the thing contained in Christ's promises. Follow good living naturally, and thy good works do but testify only and certify that the Spirit of God is in thee, whom thou hast received for an earnest of God's truth, and thou art the heir of all promises of God, that all good things are thine already purchased by Christ's blood, and laid up in store against that day, when every man shall receive according to his deeds, that is, according as his deeds declare and testify what he is and was. For they that look unto the reward are slow, false, subtle and crafty workers, and love the reward more than the work. Yea, hate the labor. Yea, hate God who commandeth the labor, and are weary both of the commandment and also of the commander and work with tediousness. But he that worketh of pure love without seeking reward worketh truly. A wonderful quote by Mr. Tyndale again. Now we turn to old Hugh Latimer. Your reward shall be great in heaven, quotes Latimer when preaching on the Beatitudes. Merce's reward, this word soundeth as though we should merit somewhat by our own works, exclaims. Reward, reward and merit are correspondent, one followeth the other. When I have merited, then I ought to have my reward. But we shall not think so, for you must understand that all our works are imperfect for we cannot do them as perfectly as the law requireth because of our flesh, which also hindereth us. Wherefore is the kingdom of God called then a reward? Because it is merited by Christ. For as touching our salvation and eternal life, it must be merited, but not for our own works, but only for the merits of our Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, believe in him, trust in him. It is he that merited heaven for us. We turn from old Hugh Latimer to William Tyndale. Sums up the matter admirably when he writes in his prologue to the book of Numbers. All that I do and suffer is but the way to the reward and not the deserving thereof. Again, Christ is Lord over all, and whatsoever any man will have of God, he must have it freely given him for Christ's sake. Now to have heaven for mine own deserving is mine own praise and not Christ's. For I cannot have it by favor and grace in Christ and by my merits also, for free giving and deserving cannot stand together. Now we turn to works and merits. The controversy over works and merit in the 16th century was, it must be remembered, a controversy with the question of man's justification. It revolved around the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of the common grace of God, whereby a measure of social response, morality and civic justice is preserved in the world at large, including unregenerate society, was not debated because it was not the point at issue. <clears throat> the reformers were not unfamiliar with the doctrine of common grace, as is shown. For the example, the assertion by Bradford that the wicked have not God's spirit of sanctification and regeneration to sanctify and regenerate them, though they have it concerning other gifts. The strictures of Articles 12, 13, and 14 are not to, intended to de deny the degrees of goodness in the social and civic realms. 
but to deny that good works are ever more notorious in such a way as to deserve the justification of a sinful man before God. Article 17, which relates to those works that are performed subsequently to salvation, declares, albeit that good works which are the fruits of faith and follow after justification cannot put away our sins and endure the severity of God's judgment. Yet they are pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ and do spring out necessarily from a true and lively faith, insomuch that by them a lively faith may be as evidently known as a tree discerned by the fruit. The scope of Article 13 is defined by the title of works before justification. Works done before the grace of Christ and the inspiration of his spirit, it says, are not pleasant to God for as much as they spring not of faith in Jesus Christ, neither do they make men meet to receive grace or, as the school authors say, deserve grace of congruity. Yea, rather, for that they are not done as God hath willed and commanded them to be done, we doubt not that they have the nature of sin. And Article 14 addresses itself to the assumption that there is a possibility of doing more than what God requires, with the corollary of the establishment of a bank of surplus merit, which may be drawn upon at large by those whose words works fall short in performance. Voluntary works, it reads, besides and over the God's commandments, which they call works of supererogation, cannot be taught without arrogancy and impiety, or by them men do declare that they do not only render unto God as much as they are bound to, but that they do more for his sake than of bounden duty is required. Whereas Christ saith plainly, when you've done all that you've commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. Pilkington explains that although God do work all th that although God do work all things himself, and as he hath appointed, so they fall out, yet he worketh them not without us. We must not be idle, we must show our diligence and obedience to God, that he hath made us commanded us to exercise ourselves in these things. And yet when all we have done we can, all praise must be given to him. We must say we are unprofitable servants. We be as an axe in the carpenter's hand, he continues. For the axe may not claim the praise of well-doing from his master that worketh with it. And though the axe be a dead instrument without life or feeling, man hath life, wit, and reason given to him to do with all. Yet is man unable to work his own salvation without free mercy, and special grace of God as an axe is unable to build the house without the direction and ruling of the carpenter. And Bradford, switching from Pelkington, Bradford preaches as follows. As concerning satisfaction by their opera in debita, undue works, that is, by such works as they need not to do, but of their own voluntariness and willfulness. Willfulness indeed, who seeth not monstrous abomination, blasphemy, and even open fighting against God. For if satisfaction can be done by man, then Christ dies in vain for him that so satisfieth, and so reigneth he in vain. So is he a bishop and a priest in vain. God's law requireth love to God with all our heart, soul, power, might, and strength. So there is nothing can be done to God which is not contained in this commandment. 
nothing can be done over and above this. Again, Christ requireth that to manward we should love one another as he loved us. And trow we that we can do any good thing to our neighborward which is not herein comprised. Dearly beloved, therefore, abhor this abomination, even to think that there is any other satisfaction to Godward for sin than Christ's blood only. Blasphemy it is, and that horrible to think otherwise. The blood of Christ purifieth, saith St. John, from all sin, and therefore he is called the Lamb slain from before the beginning of the world, because there never was sin forgiven of God, nor shall be from the beginning to the end of the world, but only through Christ's death. A conception of works of super arrogation implied a two level doctrine of Christian morality. Such super arrogatory works belong not to the sphere of ordinary man or woman, but to the small super Christian minority who, by voluntary voluntarily living as solitary hermits or in monastic communities, by voluntarily submitting themselves to the rule of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and by voluntarily afflicting their bodies with painful indignities, regarded as having achieved a holiness beyond what was required of them. <clears throat> but with ordinary level Christianity, the situation was very different. It was not long after the apostolic period when, with a view to the improvement of church discipline, and coupled with a particular application of passages like Hebrews 6.4 and 10.26, the doctrine was developed that at baptism, all sins were washed away by the blood of Christ but that this blood did not avail for sins committed after baptism, with the result that such sins could be expiated only by the endurance of such penalties and penances as the church might impose upon the offender. This led to the phase in church history when it became common practice for persons to postpone their baptism, if possible, until the hour of death in the hope that in this way they might be assured of passing into the next world free from sin. Such indeed was the spiritual insecurity and uncertainty engendered by this teaching that it led further to the doctrine of purgatory according to which no penances, however many and severe, being regarded as sufficient to purge away the defilements of post-baptismal sin, the Christian man would ordinarily have to pass through a prolonged period of purgation by flames before he was fit to enter into the heavenly state. For ordinary level Christians accordingly, this meant the great mass of church members the Christian way after baptism became one of self-effort and self-suffering without the assured confidence in the redeeming work and suffering of Christ in which the New Testament encourages us to trust. And for Christianity at both levels became a preoccupation with the inescapable problem of one's own justification and acceptance before God. The rediscovery of the gospel which brought in the Reformation inevitably meant the exposure of the unevangelical nature of all such teaching. <clears throat> Hence the statement of Article 16 of sin after baptism. Not every deadly sin willingly committed after baptism is against the Holy Spirit and unpardonable. Wherefore, the grant of repentance is not to be denied to such as fall into sin after baptism. After we have received the Holy Ghost, we may depart from grace given and fall into sin. And by the grace of God, we may rise again and amend our lives. Therefore, 
they are to be condemned who say they can no more sin as long as they live here or deny the place of forgiveness to such as truly repent. Thomas Beacon uses the Apostle Peter as an example that sinners may receive remission of their sins, though they sin after they have known the truth and are baptized. It is manifest by divers places in the New Testament who doubteth but that Peter was both baptized and knew the truth when he confessed Christ to be the Son of the living God. Did he fall again? after that when he denied Christ? Did he not afterward when he repented obtain mercy of the hand of God? Therefore doth it follow that remission of sins is not denied unto sinners if they repent and believe. Now for William Tyndale, when they say that Christ has made no satisfaction for the sin that we do after baptism. Say thou with the doctrine of Paul that in our baptism we receive the merits of Christ's death through repentance and faith, of which baptism is the sign, and though when we sin of frailty after our baptism, we receive the sign no more, yet we be renewed again through repentance and faith in Christ's blood, of which twain that sign of baptism ever continued among us in baptizing our young children, doth ever keep us in mind and call us back again unto our profession, if we be gone astray and promiseth us forgiveness. Neither can actual sin be washed away with our works, but with Christ's blood. Neither can there be any other sacrifice or satisfaction toward Godward for them save Christ's blood. For as much as we can do no works unto God, we receive only of his mercy with our repenting faith through Jesus Christ our Lord and only Savior, unto whom and unto God our Father through him and unto his Spirit that only purgeth and sanctifieth and washeth us, washeth us in the innocent blood of our redemption. Be praised forever and ever. Amen. And here we come to a close. Almighty and everlasting God, give to us genuine, lively, active, working faith, focused on your glory, focused on obedience to you as our sovereign commander. In Jesus' name, amen.